believing mothers look forward to the coming of Christ and express their desire for Christ to come and their longing for Christ to come by bringing forth the seed of the covenant, the children of the promise, those who with them are heirs of everlasting salvation. Hannah did that from the perspective of the Old Testament when Christ had not yet been born. She looked for the seed of the woman to be born at the time appointed by God. She wanted a role in that and sang a song that Mary, pregnant with Christ, picked up and made her own. In other words, this song of Hannah is inspired. She was at that moment, probably only at that moment, a prophetess. And she sang in her song a prophecy of the coming of Christ, the blessedness of covenant mothers who had a part in that great work of God. That was what Elkanah did not understand. What's the matter, Anna? Why are you so sad? Am I not better to you than ten sons? What a, what a funny thing to say. If he had had any understanding at all of Hannah's grief, he would never have made such a strange and really unkind comment questioning her love. That was not the point. God heard Sam, uh, Hannah's vow that she made and used the blessing of Eli to answer Hannah's prayer. In verse 17 we read, Eli answered and said, Go in peace. And the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. Now that was not just a pious wish on the part of Eli. That was his blessing as high priest in Israel. And Hannah received it from Eli as the promise that she would have a child because you read in the next verse, and she said, Let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. She knew that the Lord would hear her prayer. And the Lord gave her Samuel. Now, before we go into that matter of the dedication of Samuel to the Lord, I want to say a few things about Samuel. He was a man that was unique in the entire history of the people of Israel. Absolutely unique. There never was one like him. There never would be anyone like him after him. That was true in the first place because part of the vow that Hannah made was that Samuel would become a Nazarite. There were not that many Nazarites in the history of the nation of Israel. We are only told of a few. There was, for example, Samson who was a Nazarite, but who in his lust for wicked women broke his Nazarite vows. Although Samson was a child of God, don't forget that. He's listed among the heroes of faith in Hebrews 11. But nevertheless, he broke his Nazarite vows. There were some Nazarites during the time when Jerusalem was besieged by the Assyrians. Jeremiah tells us about them in his prophecy. They were the sons of Rechab, who not only had made Nazarite vows, but kept them as well. 
And the only other Nazarite we know of in the scriptures is John the Baptist, who was also a Nazarite from his mother's womb. Now that, in the first place, was a very unique calling. Nazarite was one, as you know, who might not touch a dead body, who might not drink any kind of alcoholic beverage, and who might not cut his hair. Now those were only outward things, of course, but they were vows that a Nazarite took because by taking these vows on himself, he was in the midst of the nation a constant living protest against the life of the nation. Nazarites arose in times of spiritual decline, in times of apostasy, in times when the covenant people of God had broken their covenant calling, God raised up Nazarites who by their vow that they took protested the ungodliness and apostasy in the nation of which they were a part. Because the apostasy of the nation was, if I may put it that way, indicative of the fact that they had forsaken the Lord and had become worldly, like the nations that surrounded them. They were therefore types of Christ, and they were types of Christ because Christ is the true Nazarite of God. They pointed ahead to Christ, and that was another reason why Hannah shows how dearly she was concerned about the coming of Christ. Christ is the true Nazarite because he doesn't have to take a Nazarite <coughs> vow on himself. He is separated from the world. He is separated from the apostate church. And he is separated from all wickedness around him because he is the eternal Son of God who never sinned and came into our flesh, holy and undefiled, and walked among us for 33 years as the true Nazarite of God. So that when Hannah dedicated her son to be a Nazarite, she did so in the consciousness that he would be a type of Christ. That's an amazing thing. In the second place, that vow which Hannah made that Samuel would be given, dedicated, to the Lord was a vow that meant he would be dedicated to the service of the Lord. And so he was put in the tabernacle in Shiloh on a permanent basis so that he could function in the tabernacle along with Eli and whoever was high priest after him. But you must understand that even in that respect Samuel was an unusual man. He was a prophet, he was a priest, he made sacrifices, along with Eli in the temple, and he was a judge. Now we all know, no one in the entire Old Testament history held that threefold office of prophet, priest, and king. The only one who did was not of the nation of Israel at all, but was king of Jerusalem by the name of Melchizedek. He was priest of the Most High God, king of Salem, and prophesied when he blessed Abraham. 